All right, good evening, everyone. I hope you all are well and can see and hear me just fine. Um, welcome to our demonstration lecture tonight um, with Helen Hebert. We're very excited to have her. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with the museum, we are the Robert C. Williams Museum of Papermaking, and we are located in Atlanta, Georgia, on the Georgia Institute of Technology's campus. So we're on the Georgia Tech campus and we're housed within a building called the Renewable Bioproducts Institute. And they do a lot of paper related research. Um, the museum's mission is to collect, preserve, increase, and disseminate knowledge about papermaking in the past, present, and future. We have four permanent exhibition spaces, two changing exhibit spaces, and we have a, a new temporary exhibit that's going up on display um, by next week, which we're all very, very excited about. And uh, we'll tell you more about that at the end of the program. We have one classroom and we offer programming for ages five through adult. This one obviously being for adults. And in our collection, we have over 100,000 artifacts, only a few of which are actually on display. And we have over 10,000 books in our collection as well. Um, so with us tonight, we have Helen Hebert. We are so very excited that she is joining us. Um, one of the wonderful things about being <laughs> uh, long distance is we can still meet and demonstrate from far away from each other. Um, so that's a wonderful thing about technology. So to give you a little bit of background about Helen, for those of you who are not familiar with her, Helen Hebert is a Colorado artist who constructs installations, sculptures, films, artist books, and works in paper using handmade paper as her primary medium. She teaches, lectures, and exhibits her work internationally and online, and is the author of several how-to books about paper making and paper crafts and i have her latest one with me here so we're very excited to have that new volume um, and helen has an extensive network of paper colleagues around the world and her interest in how things are made from paper keeps her up to date on current paper trends which she writes about in her weekly blog called the sunday paper she interviews paper makers and paper artists on her podcast, Paper Talk, and she holds an annual paper retreat and paper making master class uh, classes in her Redcliffe studio, which is full for this year, but you might be able to get a chance to sign up for next year. Um, so thank you everyone from coming and hope we hope you'll post in the chat where you are joining from and I am going to turn things over to Helen now so thank you so much. Thanks, Anna and Jerusha and Virginia at the museum for inviting me to speak today. And I'm gonna share my screen and do a 20 minute or so uh, slideshow and video. And then I have a few things that I'm gonna show you on my desktop. And um, there are many facets to my work in, on, and with paper. So today I'm going to focus on one aspect divided into three sections. So you see here on the left, bendable paper in the middle, an inflatable, and on the right, a Chochin lantern. And these are all sculptural vessels, often illuminated. So I'll begin with a brief history. My initial interest in handmade paper came from a trip to Japan in 1988. I studied art at the University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee, and after graduating in 1987, I moved to New York City. My father was doing research in Japan the next year, and my mom and I went for a very short visit, just two weeks, and we stayed in a traditional inn, and I was struck by the, the, the shoji screens, the room dividers, and the interaction between paper and light. A year or so later, I discovered Dudonay Paper Mill in New York City, where I was living, a facility dedicated to the art of handmade paper, many of you know it, and signed on first as an intern and then became program director, where, and I worked there for six years. And shortly after starting work at Dudonay, I went to the Penland School in North Carolina and took a class on sculptural papermaking. 
And it was in this class that I got interested in embedding string and wire in between freshly made sheets of paper. This is a short video. Um, and I, I started exploring the sculptural properties of abaca, a fiber from the non-fruit bearing banana plant. When you beat that fiber for a long time, it has incredible properties. It shrinks as it dries and it becomes translucent. Here you see a sheet of paper drying and reacting to the grid of embedded string. And I made a, a longer film called Water Paper Time, which um, some of you probably own, maybe you even supported the production of that. And that's available online as the download now. And we're dropping links into the chat as we go. So many of my ideas are too big for me to feasibly produce, both in scale, but also in terms of the amount of work required to complete them. So I often work in collaboration and or in community. And I was inspired by an article years ago in Hand Paper Making Magazine, in which Brian Queen described the process of creating a hot air balloon. I was on my way to teach at the Penland School and decided to make this an evening activity during my course. We constructed the balloon, which was a great challenge and a lot of fun, but flying it was another story. Here you see us stationed on the grassy knoll in front of the dining hall at Penland, a great place for a spectacle, but alas, the balloon did not have liftoff due to weather and wind conditions. We tried it again the next day closer to the paper studio and had success. It was early morning when the air was cooler than the hot air we were filling it with. And I'm sure you could hear our shrieks of delight in the next county as the balloon took off. I'll demonstrate how a miniature version of this vessel is constructed after the slideshow. And instructions for making a hot air balloon and an inflatable ball can be found in my book, Playing with Paper. This book is out of print now, but you can still find copies online. So you can vary the shape, the number of sections called gores, and the size of these inflatable vessels. I created this peace balloon for an anniversary celebration for Hand Paper Making Magazine. I stenciled the lettering onto the gores prior to assembly traveled across the country with them in my suitcase, and we assembled, inflated, and illuminated the balloon at the celebratory event. And then it was exhibited at the College Park Aviation Museum in Maryland, which you see here. Note that there's a fan attached to the base to keep, keep it inflated. And the text reads, one love, one light, one dream, which is part of the lyrics from a song by Bruce Marco, who performed the song at the event. Now here's a much smaller inflatable, a sphere this time, which is about seven inches in diameter. And, in, and the embroidered text reads, you are holding the world in your hands. This is an artist book created in an, an edition of 25. And the book is called Handle with Care. And I think I mentioned this, but the, the panels or the gores are created flat. I do all the stitching on the flat individual panels. And then I'm gonna show you afterwards sort of how they go together. It's a kind of a magical transformation, how it becomes three-dimensional. So I'm not stitching on in the round in other words. The text ball is five feet in diameter and a poem by Ezra Pound was rubber stamped onto the panels prior to assembly. It says, the book should be a ball of light in one's hand. This piece was created for a fundraising event called the Text Ball at the Independent Publishing Resource Center in Portland, Oregon. So I moved from New York City to Portland, Oregon in 1998 and then to Colorado in 2012. If you think those inflatable vessels are large, check out these 30 foot wide hot air balloons that the Japanese constructed towards the end of World War II. Over 10,000 of these balloons made with handmade paper were launched and engineered to be carried across the ocean to America. Only one balloon, balloon caused casualties in Oregon and many made it across the ocean. You can read about this fascinating project in Robert C. Makesh's book, Japan's World War II Balloon Bomb Attacks on North America. And uh, Ilana Soul, who, who I met in Oregon, 
also made a film about this called On Paper Wings, the story of four Japanese women who worked on balloon bombs, the families of those killed in the US, and the man whose actions brought them all together 40 years later after World War II. Now, it's difficult to talk about my career chronologically because I tend to work in the same structures and ideas over and over. So we'll rewind back to earlier in my career when I learned how to create these collapsible Japanese lanterns. In Japan, these are commonplace, hanging outside of shops and adorned with the company logo or company name, like a sign. These vessels are called chochin in Japanese. And most of you know Tim Barrett, who wrote Japanese papermaking and set up the papermaking facility and program at the University of Iowa Center for the Book, which has a big Japanese papermaking component. And oh, he also is a MacArthur genius. And um, Richard Flavin uh, illustrated Tim's book and lived in Japan for several decades. And the two of them taught a lantern making workshop at the paper and book intensive in the early 1990s. And an artist friend of mine, Judy Hoffman attended and she knew I would be interested in the material they covered. So she shared these amazing handouts illustrated by Richard with me. And I was finally able to return to Japan in 2019, 30 years after that initial trip. And my husband and I visited this lantern company in Kyoto, where they are still making these types of lanterns today. And uh, my husband and I had kind of an odyssey getting to this workshop. Uh, we got lost and then someone helped us and we arrived late, we had an appointment. And uh, when we left, my husband <laughs> said, was it worth it? Because it was just this workshop filled with all of this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, this was the highlight of my career. Yes, it was worth it. So um, in Japan, the armatures are made with wood, but Richard and Tim adapted the technique using foam core. And Judy, that artist who learned it through them, spent a day teaching me how to create a simplified chochin structure. And I have one to show you after this, I talk. And the instructions for this project appear in my book, Paper Illuminated, also out of print, but you can sometimes find used copies online. And by the way, I'm teaching a course on how to make this structure uh, collapsible Japanese lamps and lanterns in early November. And the, the class is open for registration now. And I think we're dropping a link in the chat or you can find that on my website. And I didn't want my other how-to books to feel left out. So um, I've written six in total and um, I do have two paper making books, which thanks to many of you are still in print because uh, they still keep selling. And then uh, Playing with Pop-Ups is more recent. And my most recent is The Art of Papercraft, which Anna held up earlier. And that came out just this spring and it features 40 projects designed by me and a handful of paper artists from around the world. <clears throat> and these projects are projects that can be created with a single sheet of paper. But back to the Chochin. So Isamu Noguchi made this type of lantern famous internationally when he did some contemporary designs, his line of Akari lights for the town of Mino, Japan in the 1950s. And then Isamu Noguchi Museum, which is Noguchi's old studio still sells these. And it is a fantastic place to visit if you're in New York City. It's across the river in Long Island City. And I used to live by bi lead bicycle trips there and we would stop there and at Socrates Sculpture Park, uh, which is across the street, an old landfill featuring large scale sculpture and multimedia installations. Now I've used this same technique to create more than lamps. My sculpture Mother Tree, which I created in 2010, is a seven foot tall paper dress. I embedded string between sheets of abaca to give the paper some structure as well as visual interest and glued smaller pieces together to create paper panels, which were then hand stitched together into the round to create the dress form. Here you see an intern turning the stitched vessel inside out. 
The armature was first created in half inch foam core, but ultimately I had it fabricated in wood so that the piece could be shipped and exhibited at other locations. Now I've done two large installations at an innovative library system in Denver. Um, they work with artists frequently and have many large scale public artworks in their seven branches. In 2014, I constructed this piece called The Wish at one of their branches. The dandelion seeds you see here are created uh, with that shrinking system I showed in that short video clip. And this is a permanent installation at Anything Huron Street Library. My most recent project is a giant paper lantern, seven feet tall, constructed at Anything Wright Farms in, Dem in Denver. I have an eight minute video that I'll show now that documents the project, which is called Step Into the Light. Hey everyone, it's Helen Hebert, and I wanna tell you about my recent installation, Step Into the Light. I've been building Japanese collapsible lanterns for many years. A friend taught me how to do this in New York City in, a, in the mid 1990s. And so I built this quarter scale model for this project. And then my friend and colleague, Brian Queen, did these amazing drawings um, for the armature that I needed at full scale. This actual lamp is about six feet tall and he fabricated all of the parts which he shipped to me in Denver at Anything Wright Farms Library where I created the installation. And then we spent seven days building this form. So first we assembled the armature um, which consists of 16 ribs, some stabilizers, a top and bottom ring. This is all collapsible, which you'll see at the end. Uh, I straightened some reed and then cut these reed rings. There are 79 reed rings and they're joined by splicing the rings and overlapping and then winding a piece of Japanese paper around each ring. So the rings were all fit onto the armature. This took us two days and I had a fantastic crew of volunteers. I was working at Anything Right Farms in Denver. This is an amazing library with such cool features. They check out cricket makers and sewing machines. They have such interesting programs. And um, here I am with my friend Jill Powers, who was one of the volunteers, winding a reed or, or fitting a reed onto the armature. Um, there are little notches in the armature, which you can't see at this distance. Staff from the library assisted me as well. I had three volunteers a day in two hour shifts. Then I had my own artist friends, um, one a day who came to help, which was so wonderful. I could never have done this by myself. I would have gone crazy <laughs> winding all these reeds and applying paper. I love how the armature looked covered with reeds, but we had to proceed. So first I taped the panel, paper panels in place, alternating panels, and then um, we had to glue each paper panel to the reeds and being careful not to get glue onto the rib structure underneath because that had to be removed. So this was the most tedious task, gluing three to four reeds at a time in each section and then tamping the paper down onto onto the reeds so that it connected. This took another day, and again, I was so thankful for the volunteers. Next, the alternating panels had to be put on, and I put them on and made sure that they fit and had enough overlap To glue these sections, 
I did the same thing, putting glue onto the reeds, but then I also had to put glue onto the seams so that the seams would overlap onto the paper that was already there. Applying all of the paper panels took another two days. Next, I added a message by collaging paper letters onto the completely wrapped lantern. And um, you'll be able to read the message at the end of this video. Now came the scary part, removing that armature. Uh, I think there were nine of us. Um, the armature weighed 80 pounds. Next, we removed these outer rings and then inner rings, and then the 16 ribs had to be carefully removed um, without damaging any of the paper. And here is the paper shell all by itself. And this lantern is collapsible, which I love. So the top and bottom had uh, special rings to be added. The top ring had all of the parts for connecting it to the ceiling and wiring a lamp. And finally, it was installation day. We had a cherry picker and ladders, and the lantern was suspended from the ceiling from four points. Uh, a light was wired inside. This is about the height of a person that's six feet tall and about four feet in diameter. And there you see all of the ribs. Here's that bottom ring that adds some weight and holds the bottom edge of the lantern. And then the quote reads, you may think your light is small, but it can make a huge difference in other people's lives. So when you walk into the library, you walk down this long hallway and approach the lantern and then you can re walk around it and read the quote. And my intention is for viewers to think about themselves as the light when they stand underneath the lantern and peer up into it. And then to step outside of the lantern and think of themselves as the light in the world and how they can spread their light to others. Okay, I was scared to press any buttons because I might mess up, but I think it's okay. Um, by the way, the shelves surrounding that lantern um, are filled with books about light. And this library was so receptive to all of my ideas, which was wonderful. So I wanted people to come in and read, uh, sit and reflect about themselves as the light, but also be able to read books about light, whether it be religious or scientific um, or art. So that's a cool aspect. And if anyone's in the Denver area, we're having a culminating event for this piece and the library's summer reading program this Saturday night, July 30th. Um, just a few more slides. I wanna show you, this is my studio in Redcliffe, Colorado, high up in the Rocky Mountains near the ski towns of Vail and Beaver Creek. It's a classroom in an old schoolhouse, which was converted into artist studios when the school closed in the 1980s. And um, 
as Anna mentioned at the top, I host annual paper making master classes and a paper retreat. And I sometimes have private students and interns in the studio. And I started teaching online in 2017, and I have a membership pro group now called The Paper Year, where we explore a different paper technique each month in an encouraging and inspiring community. And these are not paper making techniques. They are um, working with dry paper. So paper engineering, paper folding, things like that. And then this is my last slide. I just wanted to show you the header and footer of my website. So you see that free paper advisor. I have a little um, resource online. If you click on that link on my website, you'll be added to my mailing list and you'll also get lots of uh, free little videos on how to make things. And um, uh, there's a place to ask the paper advisor questions and um, resources for where to find uh, paper making supplies and paper craft supplies. And then if you subscribe to my blog, The Sunday Paper, that uh, features paper facts from around the globe every Sunday. And I also host a podcast called Paper Talk. And I have a Facebook group called The Paper Studio where we share what we're creating with paper. Okay, thank you very much for watching. I'll stop the share. And now, um, uh, I think we'll take questions at the end. So let me show you a few things on my desktop here. All right, so I wanted to just show you a few, a few samples of those three things I talked about. Um, the first was the handmade paper and that miraculous shrinking that happens. So here's um, a grid of paper, which I just had. Um, the video showed more than just horizontal and vertical, but you can see at every crossing of a horizontal and vertical, the paper just puckers as it dries, um, which is really fascinating. And this is Abaca. And um, here's another form that I work with quite a bit. And that sculpture, The Wish, was created with several hundred of these that were attached to uh, bamboo uh, rods. And um, you see here, okay, there's a little magnet in here because I use this for something else. But, um, you, this puckering just happens naturally. Now I did hand cut um, the the outer edges. That's why they look so straight. So I created this form within a larger sheet of paper and then cut it out. But it's just wonderful how um, how how the shrinkage, the quality, the qualities you get from that shrinkage. And this often happens, like I leave the studio and come back the next day and find these things. They're flat when I make them. And then this is a piece with wire. Uh, if you remember the lamp in the very first slide, I made several pieces with embedded wire, which you can then bend. And that's why I call this bendable paper because now I can bend it, it'll hold its shape. And then I frequently uh, stitch several pieces together so that I can make uh, vessels that are in the round. And because I'm embedding the wire in between two sheets, I can also uh, trap things and other things in between there, like uh, an inclusion or um, other decorative elements. So I love the sound of Abaca as well. And then I always leave the ends um, of the wire, this is floral wire, um, but I work often with 18 gauge copper or brass wire that don't rust. I don't like the rust. Um, it also weakens the paper, but then I can attach the ends of the wire to lamp parts to create a lamp. And next I'm gonna show you an inflatable. So all of those inflatable forms, like the hot air balloon, um, were created from a template 
um, and then you um, uh, actually there are programs online that help you figure out how to draw these templates. Um, you can see this is a shrunk down one, but I actually plotted. So like every inch I drew the line out to the number that the um, the program told me to, to get this form. And this creates an egg shape, which um, I'll blow up in a minute. Um, so you can actually choose with this program how many gore sections you want and uh, the height and diameter of your piece. And so this just makes a tiny sort of six inch tall egg shape. And I used eight gores. And so I had them just like this. Um, and that's when I did the stitching or um, uh, the stenciling on the flat pieces. That takes a, quite a bit of planning though, because you have to put them together in the correct order for the text to read properly. And then you put them together. I have a little sample here, but I'm gonna just start by showing you. Um, so you set one piece down and then you glue on the right side and you put the next one on top. And then you glue on the left side for the second one and you glue on top and then you glue on the right. So you're alternating. And then what ends up happening is this, this is eight gores. It's like an accordion. So I, can, I hope you can see that. So it's down up and then these are glued and then it's glued inside and then these. So this is just an accordion, but it's it's shaped. So I can't just pull it out like an accordion book. But, but they were all put together. I crinkled the paper, um, one on top of the other. And so that's where the sequencing is really important because you have to, you have to glue them together the right way. And believe me, I've done that incorrectly many times. And then at the very end, after you have all your gores together, you know you've done it right. If the top and bottom one are the same way so that they can be attached. I'm going to do that right now and show you just quickly. I'm going to uh, attach, put some glue. This is tracing paper, by the way. It works really well for these forms. Abaca works well too. And there's a paper called kite paper that works well. It has to be something that is um, doesn't let the air through. So some of the Japanese papers are not so good because they don't hold the air. So I've just put a light bead of glue all the way down that edge, and then I'm gonna glue this edge to it. And so I'm connecting that final seam. And so now it, it's coming into the round. So I would actually blow air in the center, but I have this other one here that I'm gonna show you. Tissue paper works well. So um, I often cap the bottom end. So there's a circle that I've glued on to close one end. And then, I don't know if you can see me really tiny, maybe. I'm gonna blow into this and inflate it. And so there you go. So this small scale, you can fill up with your own hot air and it stays inflated. But um, larger scale, you might need a hair dryer or a fan, which I showed with that giant um, balloon. And they, they don't stay inflated for a long time. I had that text fall exhibited at an evening event and it gradually lost air throughout the night. So it's better to have it continually inflated. Um, one other thing with the hot air balloon constructions, uh, because they're building balloons that have to go up and travel through the air, they often put string right when they're gluing the seams together, they put string in to add a little more stability. So it's fascinating. And um, I think I made the choching first. I'm gonna show you that next. But the choching and the hot air balloon, it's very simple, similar structures. 
with these sections that are shaped like this. And, um, but one has an armature, which you'll see in just a moment, and the other one does not. So I was, I have many different shaped armatures and this was my, a smaller, small-ish one. So I'm gonna bring this up a little. So you can see my, um, uh, this was a vase kind of shape. And so this is the foam core armature and it is simply eight of these. Again, this can be a different number. I did 16 for that big lantern you just saw the video of. So I cut eight of these and then I have two hub rings cut of, from foam core that these just slip into. And then I'm using reed. So this is basket making reed. And you can see these straight pins. So I have little marks on here of where I want to put the reed. Um, I usually do about two inches apart. We did one inch apart for my giant lantern and that's why we had 79 of them. Um, but the more you have, the more true your form becomes. Um, and so then the reed just gets wound around and held up against the straight pins. And then you cut it and create a ring. And then you, so this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine reed rings. And then I talked about in the video, I talked about the notches. I'm going to show you. So this was the first time I experimented with notches instead of straight pins. Um, but the reed fits right on there. And um, when you apply the paper, which I would do next, it's flush with the edge of the foam core. Whereas here, it bumps up. So it's a little different. And um, the, the link I shared about the uh, Isamu Noguchi Museum, it goes right to the Akari Lights page. And there's a video, which is really good that you can watch of them making uh, one of these in Japan using the wooden armature and winding the reed. I believe that one has the, re the reed is spiraling. So you can either spiral it or create rings and I create rings. And then I just have, so that I'm back to a different shape now, but this is just the spherical form of one of these collapsible. So I've integrated a uh, commercial lamp part so that I can sit this on top of an actual lamp. And then the form just unfolds into the round. I can set it on top of a lamp or hang it from the ceiling. And then it's collapsible and you can see, so I just have two of these decorative panels that shows you the shape of the panel. And then the ones in between, there are two or three, three in the plain paper that are just um, in between. So that's what I have to show you. And now I'm happy to answer any questions if people have any. And we can switch back to my face probably. Starting with some of the first questions. Um, what kind of glue were you using? Rice starch, PVA, et cetera. We have that from two different people, so. Okay, yeah. I use PVA. Um, what I just showed you with the hot air balloon or the little inflatable and for my lantern. Uh, I did test rice paste because that's what they use in Japan. And I just, uh, I was nervous about the project and I just didn't feel as comfortable. I didn't like my test. I'm not remembering exactly why now, um, <laughs> but I was just like, I'm going to use what I know. Now in Japan also, they use a really big brush and they brush 
over, if you watch that Noguchi video, over several ribs at a time, and it goes much quicker. This was the first time I was building a giant one, and I just, I, I was wanted to be patient and uh, not, not uh, try that yet. But I'm, I'm curious to try that with my next one if I do another big one. Perfect. And we have a question from Lizzie Duquette. What kind of paper did you use to make the seven inch lantern? Uh, probably the seven foot, the big one, I'm thinking. Ah, yes, sorry, I misread that seven foot. Um, and I said six foot in the video. I have to look up which it is, sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um, I used a commercial Japanese paper. I believe it's called Kozoshi. And it's from Hiromi paper. I got it on a roll and I was able to roll the roll out and cut all of the paper panels. I did that before I went down to the library. So I had a few things prepared. And thankfully the pattern was accurate and it all worked out. Perfect. And then our next question is from Terry Power. Hi, Helen. Are there some good ways to create a paper light that could cast shadows onto a wall or wall and four, like either painting onto the paper or to create the projected image or having a shadow cast through a cut stencil on the paper? Yeah, I think you would have to have cutouts for a shadow to be cast. Um, you you really have to experiment. It's um, it's not as easy as you think. And the distance from your uh, from your cutout to the wall, the light source, you know, there's bright, there's focused light, there's soft light. So there are many things to, to test with that. Um, I do a project that's called a shadow lantern where we, we have a balsa wood in between two sheets of paper. So there's a cutout and then balsa wood and then a plain sheet. And so the light inside casts the shadow from the cutout just to the plain sheet, but it's only going about a quarter inch. And even with that small uh, distance, um, the type of light you put inside makes a big difference. That's what I have to say about that. I don't, I don't have a total answer. <laughs> Wonderful. And then the next question from Liz Lloyd, I think you mentioned you used a type of tracing paper, but what type of paper and glues do you use for the little balloon shaped lantern that you did the accordion style demonstration with? Yeah, that was tracing paper. So you can buy that tracing paper on a roll that's white or yellow. So that was the yellow and it comes different widths. So even the text ball, that really big ball that I made was that same tracing paper, probably two foot wide. And then when you're when you're calculating how 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 many gores you need, you have to know what size paper you can get. So that went into my calculation. Um, I have used tissue paper just for wrapping gifts. That works well. And then I've used my own handmade abaca. And a couple of times I've coated paper with konyaku, if you know that uh starch um it's a japanese starch that seems to provide a barrier um because just um some japanese papers you think they would work but they they don't hold the air when you inflate wonderful and our next question from Liz Lloyd, do any of your books show step-by-step -step photos of the process? I teach high school sculpture and have been wanting to try to find a way to incorporate paper lanterns. Yes, all of my books have step-by-step. -step. So you can check them out from the library and see which one you might want to get for your, your own. Um, paper Illuminated is, all about paper and light. So it's all paper lanterns, not, not all lanterns, but lanterns, lamps, folding screens, things like that. And then my book, Playing With Paper, has a couple of projects. And my new book, The Art of Paper Craft, as well. Um, so those three books. Playing With Pop-Ups is more about pop-ups. And then the other two are paper making. OK. Perfect. We have a couple questions about your abaca. So where do you acquire your abaca? 
and how long of a beat time are you using with the abaca pulp for the the flowers and the lights? Mm -hmm. um, I get my abaca from Carriage House Paper, it's a paper making supplier, and I like to use the premium abaca. Um, I just like the color. Uh, sometimes I use the unbleached. It has a beautiful golden hue, but that seems to change from order to order. Uh, so it's related to the source. Um, and what was the second part? Oh, how, um, how long would it be? Time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is very variable. Um, I beat mine for three hours at zero, and I can get a pretty good high shrink. Other beaters, other people with the same beater will beat it for eight hours, even longer. You know, so you really have to test it. And I actually do a test, especially when I go teach somewhere where we're using a new beater, well, I, where I'll beat it. I see it make two shifts in consistency. And then I, I make a test sample, just a small little circle and I blow dry it or I leave it overnight, depending on my timing, how much time I have. And I look at it and I see, is it translucent? Is it shrinking? And then if it's not, I beat it longer. So I really think that is an art beating, but I do three hours a uh, very hard beat in my David Reyna beater. Okay, perfect, thank you. And um, our next question from Diana, she's asking about the program you were mentioning at the Denver Library on Saturday. Is it open to the public or is it only for summer reading participants? No, it's open to the public. And if you go to my website, um, or you can email me if you have any problems, but go to my website and under about and then installations, you'll see step into the light and the invitation is there. Perfect, thank you. And which library is that at again? Yeah, you can look on their website too. Good point. Um, anything Right Farms, W-R-I-G-H-T. Anything Right Farms Library. Thank you so much. And our next question from Cornelia. Um, do you have a, a photo or would you share with us a little bit about how you make the flexible wire paper or the wires set inside the decal in a frame or is it just one single pass in the vat of Abaca fiber? Um, I'm trying to think if I have something somewhere on my website. I do wanna make a bunch of paper making videos just with little things like that. So I'll describe the process. Um, I just make one sheet of abaca, I cooch it onto a felt, and then I lay the wires on top of that fresh sheet on my felt, and then I make a second sheet and I cooch it on top of the wires. So the wires are in between two sheets. So you can see paper on both sides and the wires mm -hmm. sticking out. So it's two sheets, it's embedded. Perfect, thank you. And then we have a couple questions about the reed rings. First of all, what product do you use for the reed rings, what size they are, and um, do you wet them at all when you're bending them? Uh, that's a great question. I had not wet them prior to the large installation. Um, and I use number four round reed. Um, I wanna try smaller because in Japan they use smaller, but they are actually in that shop I visited, they're cutting their own bamboo and whittling it down and making, it's incredible. Um, so I get it from some place called, it's called Basket Makers Catalog online. And um, so I use number four round read. And yeah, for the smaller pieces, I don't wet it, but for those large rings, I did find wetting it helped. So I just took, you buy it by the pound. So I took the whole pound and soaked that. And then I stretched it. I think there was in the video one, I stretched it out along a table and just clipped it to both ends so that it unwound and was uh, a little more flexible. But I didn't want it wet when I was gluing it. So I left it overnight and then used it. Perfect. So. And, um... What kind of lights do you use to illuminate the lanterns? Oh, it's all different. I have 
used so many different from just little tea lights to candles um the um it depends the safe there's a safety issue obviously with paper and light so um you have to keep the the bulb cool enough so that when it's at the closest point to the paper it's uh, below 90 degrees celsius that's like the government regulation and that's pretty darn hot so in that big lantern we just have i don't even remember a 100 watt bulb and it's in its own globe protector, and okay. then it's in the lantern, and it's it's several feet from the paper. Um, and so I usually look for low wattage, and then you know fluorescent lights and LEDs aren't hot, so we're fortunate that these things keep coming out. They're newer and newer innovations in lighting. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question again about how to, can you review how you got the armature out again from the lantern? Yeah, let me show. Well, this one's a little different. Um, no, it's not. So if I cover this with paper, just imagine this is completely covered. Um, the, the holes, there's a hole at the top and the bottom, and those have to be big enough to get everything out because once it's covered, um, this is a trickier one actually than my lantern that I built at the library because the bottom was just big enough. Uh, I collapsed, so I took, so I can take these all out, but imagine there's paper. So I had to, um, actually I had to remove these circles and then slip the, um, the ribs through the hole. And that's why these are, this shape so they're skinny so you can wiggle them through that small hole you can't just have a solid big shape on the inside it's got the same profile so that you can slip it through the hole i hope that makes sense um you can take my workshop and do it in person <laughs> thank you and um jumping back to the light bulbs inside real quick have you ever um needed to add any sort of fire retardant to the paper itself? I have not. I, I just think that is like adding that chemical is kind of yucky. Um, I know if you do something in a theater setting, you would be required to do that because, you know, a lot of people go to the theater and everything has to be fireproof. So I believe carriage house paper still sells fire retardant for I mean, they've sold it for years, and I think I looked recently for coating your paper if you want to do that. But I've just, um, that's not a requirement from Underwriters Laboratories this is a government agency, um, which would, if you went into commercial production of lamps, you would have to get uh, certification from them. They don't require that. They require that that 90 degree thing where the bulk, the, the temperature of the paper doesn't get above that. Perfect. And um, you talked a little bit about the reeds. Where do you purchase that reed for the rings? From basketmakerscatalog.com. Perfect. And we've talked about the abaca, so I'm going to skip over that question. Um, have you ever used methyl cellulose as an adhesive? I don't find it to be sticky enough. Um, I've used it sometimes when I make paper and I'm just gluing paper to paper in the wet process to ensure that things adhere more like collage, but it's not strong enough uh, for, for these types of forms. In fact, one time I made a whole lamp, just a traditional wire lamp shade and I created handmade paper panels and I wrapped them and I use no glue, so that's sometimes an option. With the abaca, it's got a stickiness. I was using cotton though, and they shrunk and all popped off and I had to redo the whole thing. So now I'm just careful. I tend to use the PVA. Perfect. Rice paste is stronger. So I would say PVA, then rice paste, then methyl cellulose in terms of how strong. Strength. And then your large form for the lantern, uh, was that 
laser cut. I believe you had it professionally made um, by your friend. Yeah, um, Brian cut that on a CNC machine. So okay. he pro he programmed one and then cut all sixteen, and then there were the the hubs, and then a few other parts. Yeah. Wow. And for your little foam one, do you um, just cut that with an exacto knife, or do you, what do you use to cut those? Yes, I just have a pattern that I trace, and then I use an exacto knife. Okay. Awesome. And then our next question is from Carlos Muniz. Who are your paper peer, uh, oh, sorry, it jumped on me. Just give me a second. Uh, who are your paper purveyors? Do you have different ones? Which ones? Um, so I know you said you get your Abaca from Carriage House. House. For my paper making supplies, I order from Carriage House. Uh, Twin Rocker is in Indiana. Um, Arnold Grummers, I sometimes order um, student molds and different things from them. They also carry Abaca and other fibers. Those are my main. Perfect. Um, and then have you, from Cornelia, have you ever worked with um, Korean Hanji paper? And if so, what projects have you done? Yes, I have used Korean Hanji. Um, I'm trying to remember what for. Um, I used it for a project in my paper year. Um, I'm not remembering exactly what I like. I love it because it comes in many different colors. That's what I like about the Hanji. It's not quite as translucent as um, as the Japanese papers I've worked with. Uh, and you know what I used it most recently for? It was the blue paper for the lettering on Step Into the Light. That is Korean Hanji. I really like that color. Very cool. It was a beautiful color. Um, next question from Gil Ray. Does paper grain make a difference with your lanterns? Um, no. I'm my handmade paper, I don't feel like it has a grain, so I shake it both directions. Um, if I were making a lantern that folded, because I've done so many different lanterns. Um, in my book, Paper Illuminated, there's an accordion fold with pop-ups, so the grain would be important. It would fold along the accordions. Um, so I pay attention to it if I'm folding, but otherwise, I haven't noticed it in these larger projects. Okay, perfect. And we have a whole bunch of questions left, so we will not be getting to all of them tonight. I will, um, I'm going to kind of read through these questions and see if there's any that we haven't, uh, any topics we haven't touched on at all and try and get those answered. Um, one I saw was about the metal that you used in between your sheets of abaca um, for the bin, the little flowers or the paper that has that kind of natural warping because of the, the way the abaca dries. What kind of wire are you using for that? Well, the flower shape is string. So string and wire okay. dry differently. And um, if you watch my video, Water Paper Time online, you do have to pay for the full version, but there's a, there's a longer trailer that you can watch you might see a little bit more. So I use 18 gauge wire, brass or copper. What I showed you was floral wire. I find that bends just right. It's easy enough to bend. It reacts to the paper shrinkage. Um, if I use steel, it's 20 gauge because steel is harder. And then the flower forms and the grid form that you saw in that mini video are linen bookbinding thread. Um, I like linen or hemp. I feel like they shrink the most compared to cotton. It doesn't shrink as much. So I'm using and different threads. Would that thread be unwaxed then? Yes, unwaxed. Okay. Waxed Perfect. might work. I haven't tried it. I just thought it might interfere. So I don't know. Perfect. And then uh, you mentioned at one point a computer program to design the large form. Um, do you do that with any of your other forms to make the measurements? 
I did that a long time ago. Brian actually turned me on to a website. You can still look online. It's in Spanish, but I do believe it translates. But you you really have to kind of study it to figure it out. It's called Turma, T-U-R-M-A, Del, D-E-L, Plata, P-L-A-T-A. And then you want to look on the menu for Moldes, M-O-L-D-E-S. And those are the different shapes. So there's all these different hot air balloon shapes. And that's where you get to where you can say how many gore sections, what height, et cetera, et cetera. And there's no circle there. There's probably, I'm sure there's a website where you can get the programming for a circle. Um, so I just took the hot air, the top of a hot air balloon and then did the same thing on the bottom. So I did a quite a bit of hand drawing and figuring that out, but if you're a whiz, I'm like just a little too old to do all that myself on the computer. <laughs> so if you're a computer whiz, I'm sure you can figure it out. And there are programs out there. AutoCAD, I think Brian uses, yeah. Awesome. So I'm gonna read off a couple last questions. Um, are your uh, Chochin armatures all based on established patterns or is there flexibility when creating the armatures and are you cutting each piece by hand? Yes, I'm cutting them by hand. If you have access to a laser cutter or a, a other kind of cutter, CNC, you could cut these on that. You just have to be able to draw, do the drawings for the machine. Um, I have drawn, so anything in profile. So I just decided, oh, I want this shape. So I did a sketch and then I figured out where the hubs needed to go just by looking at the simple circle sphere. And in the class that I teach, I'll talk about this, like how to design your own shapes. I've done many different shapes. So yes, you can go on all kinds of tangents. Perfect. And then the last question is a little bit of a funny one. We have a few comments in the chat about the lampshade um, that's on the little teal lamp behind you and the, and the baby face on it. And did you make that? That's me. Um, yeah, that's my baby picture. I didn't know I should do that. Okay. And yes, I taught a class last year. Send me an email if you're interested. I might teach it again. It was an online class. And that's a panel shade. So I showed how to cover just a ready-made panel shade with um, panels of paper. That project is also in my book, Paper Illuminated. Wonderful. I thank you so much. And to all the questions that we didn't get to today, you can either email me or email Helen and we will get those questions answered. Hopefully we got to most of them. So I am going to close us out real quick and we are going to call it an evening. So like I said, thank you everyone so much for uh, coming this evening. If you are interested in free programs like this one that we do, then we ask that you consider donating to the museum support fund so that we can continue to offer free programs like this to uh, https colon backslash backslash mygeorgiatech.gatech.edu slash giving backslash uh, paper making dash museum. Um, so that we, we love to be able to host these free programs and we certainly want to be able to continue to do so. Um, and these are all of our social media handles. So you can find information about what we do and all of our upcoming program, which we just got posted on our website. Not all the registration links are live yet, but all of our fall programming is online on our website at www.paper.gatech.edu. So whether it's a virtual program or an in-person program, you can take a look at what we're gonna be offering. And Helen shared her social media earlier and we will um, share it again in the email so that you can connect to her website and look at her upcoming classes as well um, so that you can join us for her program or our program, which, whichever suits your interest. Um, so just a final thank you to Helen. Thank you so much. We were so excited to have you tonight. It was a really a fantastic program. And I hope everyone you enjoyed um, the program as well. And I'd also like to say a quick thank you to those helping me behind the scenes, Drew Graham, our exhibits coordinator and Virginia Howell, our director who are backstage helping with the chat and answering those um, 
questions and adding those links in. So thank you everyone so much for coming this evening. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.